If you and I were to meet for the first time and you were to say, hi, I'm Jim, and I were to reply, hi, I'm Leslie, that would be accepted as normal. But if you were to say, hi, I'm Jim, and I was to say, hi, I'm Leslie, and before you got a chance to speak again, I also said, I am the husband of Maureen, and I am the father of Ruth Ann, Leslie, and LaDonna, and I'm the grandfather, and I rhymed off the six uh, names of the grandchildren, and I'm a preacher, and I live in Tarpon Springs, and I was born in Ireland, you would probably find it highly unusual, therefore we don't do that. But if I did do it, it would certainly give you a lot of different perspectives of who I am that you didn't know before. You wouldn't have to ask, was I married? I just told you I was married to Maureen. Did I have children? I just told you. What do I do? I'm a preacher. Where were you born in Ireland? I told you a whole lot just by extending that little bit relating to my name. My name's Leslie. And then I went on and said some extra things. There is so much involved in God that he has to break himself down into bits and pieces, we would say today, in order for us to grasp it. And each bit, not a good way to say it, but each part that he breaks himself down into, as revealed in the Old Testament, he gives a name to that particular part of God. It still is God fully, but in that particular perspective. You're at work, and you're working with somebody who is a computer whiz kid for five years, but you've never socialized. All you know, he's a computer whiz kid. But on one occasion, you visit his home. And you say, my goodness, look at that beautiful painting on the wall. Who's the artist? Where'd you get that? Well, he said, I'm the artist. I painted it. And this painting, yeah, I painted that one too. Suddenly you know more about him. For five years you knew he was a computer whiz kid. Now you know he's also an artist. And then there's a beautiful baby grand and he sits down and plays like Rachmaninoff. He said, I didn't know you were a musician too. So suddenly you're adding to your knowledge of who he is. That's what God does. In the Old Testament, he keeps breaking himself down and emphasizing this part, and he emphasizes that, and he emphasizes that at different points over his dealings with the children of Israel. And even before that, starting way back, Abraham, even way before that, God breaks himself down. Then, of course, and we're not going here tonight uh, to this point, then he brings it all together, and he puts himself into the Jehovah of the Old Testament who is Jesus of the New Testament, and he is the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. But in order for us to get as much knowledge as we can about God, and therefore about Christ, we should study these perspectives to which he gives different names. And I'm sure you would agree with me, we have been over not only many of his names, but some of his very unusual names, taking whole services to go into it. Tonight we're going to look at El Olam, which is different again, a most unusual name. Let's look at our notes, if you would, and we'll go down some of the things that we've already looked at in days gone by. And this is just a shortened list by a long shot, just a shortened list. But there's El Elyon, the Most High God. El Rohai, the God who sees me. El Shaddai, the Almighty, the Sustainer. Literally, I've told you it many times, the big-breasted one that looked this way for a second, the picture is of the hopeless, helpless child at the mother's breast. God saying, I know you're hopeless and helpless without me, but there's ample milk, there's ample food for you. That's a beautiful picture. That's El Shaddai. And then El, El Hohi, Israel, he is the God of Israel. El Bethel, now that's an interesting one. Look back this way real quick. The word Beth, B-E-T-H, when you see it in the Bible, it always means the house of something. Bethlehem, Bethlehem in the Hebrew means the house of bread. Bethel, or we say Bethel, is the house of God. His name's El, so Bethel is the house of God. And Jacob knew about the house of God before he really got to know about the God of the house. A lot of people know about the house of God, but they don't know about the God of the house. And so the God of the house of God, literally, is El Bethel. There it is there, the God of the house of God. And then the one that we're... And there's all the scriptures given there for your reference when you study deeper at home. And then there's El Olam. And El Olam first appears in the Bible 
And El, as you know, is one of the names of God, Elohim in the plural. Genesis 21, verse 33, that's the first time we come across it. And here's how it's translated into the English. And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba, literally, but we say Beersheba, and called there on the name of the Lord. And then it says, the everlasting God. Well, of course, the Hebrew doesn't say that. The Hebrew says, and he called on the name of the Lord, El Ulam. Look back this way, if you would, for a second. And let's say just a few quick things and, and try not to go on down the notes. Just stay where we are so we can flow together. God's so nice, as it were, to emphasize and to highlight this particular name because of what it can mean to us. It's such a comforting one. So I'd like you to listen to it carefully and we'll say a few things before we do go back to the notes. We know him as the rock of ages. But just to, what does that mean? Well, literally it means the rock of the different ages or the different stages of our lives or of his dealings with the children of man or dealing with the children of Israel in particular. In other words, if you're going through a particular phase at this time, whatever it is, he's the rock. If this time next month or last month, it was a different kind of a phase. He still is the rock. He's trying to say, I'm the rock of all ages or all phases of what you might be going through. In other words, I'm up to meeting your needs and taking care of you whatever particular stage. So he's the rock of the different stages. Only the way we say it is the rock of the different ages. That's just what it means. Now, it also means, of course, he's the rock of all ages. Obviously, he's the everlasting God. But you have to break it down to get the meaning of El, El, El Olam, because it means I am sufficient for this particular time, whatever this particular time happens to be in your life. Most people are afraid or bewildered by change. Maybe your life has changed recently. Maybe it's changing right at this moment. Uh, sometimes we're in prosperity, sometimes we're in adversity. Uh, maybe you were a boss and now you're not in your work. Maybe you were not a supervisor, now you are. Uh, maybe you had a lot of money and now you don't. Uh, maybe something struck your life, struck your body, struck your family, whatever. Whatever it was struck and has changed you. And we all have a tendency to fear change. We get bewildered by it. And when God introduces El, 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 El alone. El alone, he says this, I want you to know that I am sufficient for the situation, what you're going through, but it means, El Olam means something else. Please get it. This is the last part, then we'll get back to the notes. It also means, please get this, this, I'm not saying these things myself. This is built into the meaning of El Olam. That he is the God who is the God of secrets, and He will reveal to you things you didn't know before because you didn't need to know them, but now that you're in this new stage in life or your new stage with Him, you need to know certain things in order to handle your circumstances successfully. Olam means that I am the God who will reveal all that you need to handle this new situation, be it prosperity or adversity. Did I make that clear? Give me a little wave if I did. It's beautiful for God to do that, really. It's an assurance name. It's a reassurance name to say there's a lot of things hidden from you. But don't worry, when you get into your new circumstances, I will reveal as you go. Our, good fr our late good friend of Mooring and I and our children too, uh, Corrie Ten Boom. She is a friend of ours. She's a wonderful, wonderful lady. She used to say, you know that God does not usually give you the bus ticket until you get to the bus depot just before the bus leaves. But we all wanted three months ahead of time. And so God not only is not spooked by your change in circumstances, He's not surprised. God has never once been known to say, oops, as if that caught Him by surprise. But He knows what you need not only strength-wise, but understanding-wise to be able to handle that new phase of your life. That's it in the broadest terms. El Olam, 
El Olam. El, of course, is for Elohim. That's the strong one. Olam is this other what I have told you about just now, that one who gives us the secrets and the strength in order to deal with the changing circumstances that we find ourselves in. Let's read a little bit more about that, starting again there at the bottom of that list, number six, and then we'll continue in our notes. El Olam, Genesis 21, 33, And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord El Olam, the everlasting God. If you would read all of Gen look back this way a quick second. If you were to read all of Genesis 21, you would find that God did something that was spectacularly different. Uh, in his life, he is looking upon Hagar and Ishmael. You remember that son that was born of that uh, couple coming together? And God says, throw them out. Put them out. It was such a shocking change. Then God makes a covenant with them, and he says, I see, you're the God of the, you're El, El, El Olam. You're the God of the ages. No matter what situation I'm in, you're still God. Everything may, may go wrong, but you're still God. In fact, Paul takes up that idea of kicking them out and saying, that is a picture of the law and grace. And when grace comes, then the law has to be kicked out. It's a violent change. God sometimes changes violently. For example, you know, the Old Testament, chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter, he is demanding the law. And suddenly he says, the law is gone as a means of salvation. Now it's grace. It has taken, you're talking about a change. Why the, the Pharisees couldn't accept it. They didn't understand the rock of all stages. What has happened in your life? God is the sufficient God, not only to give you strength, but to give you the wisdom that you need to happen when you've had a dramatic change in your life, because He's a God who allows dramatic changes in all our experiences, both in life and spiritually speaking. That's a little redundant because I just said it before. I just wanted to drive home the point. Now we'll start reading below that line. It says, in God's dealings with us, excuse me, there are successive times or ages or dispensations. This is all, of course, a mystery or a hidden secret. Such secrets are only revealed as we go, grow and go from strength to strength and from glory to glory. El Olam is the everlasting God that's in the stretched out version. Then you break it down, of course. El Olam is the everlasting God who deals with us in stages, or we could say ages, or time frames, periods of time to fulfill his purposes. During each phase, he imparts strength. That's in the L part of the name, and reveals the necessary secrets to see us through that particular phase because he is the rock of ages. That is, he's the rock of the various ages or the time frames because he's surprised by nothing and he has what it takes to bring you through even when your circumstances were changed abruptly. That's what El Olam is saying. Now we continue. God is always introducing change to fulfill his purposes. Moses, Joseph, Paul, John the Baptist, etc. Let me just take John the Baptist for a moment as an illustration. You can look this way. God is the one who sets up the Levitical order of the priesthood. Like this and this over here. God sets that up. It goes on for year after year. It goes on for decade after decade. It goes on for century after century after century. Here comes Zacharias going to have a miracle baby with Elizabeth. They were very old. They weren't going to have a child. They have a child. It's going to be, as you know, John the Baptist. And so the people gather around and say, well, we know what it's going to be. It's going to be Zacharias Jr. You've got to keep the tradition going. And God suddenly says, no, it's nothing to do with Zacharias. And he doesn't even allow Zacharias to speak for several months in case he makes, messes it up by saying the wrong things. So God said, no, just hold it. I'm changing. There is a song that says, Move, 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 oh, move with God, glory, hallelujah. As true saints of, as true sons of God have trod, glory, hallelujah. God is moving. This is 
the moving day. So let us then determine in our hearts the way God's moving and move with God. One of the greatest things that you can receive from God as a gift is when you've got a knowledge that God is moving in your life and you can be sure it's going to be dramatic. And nothing more so than when it happened with John the Baptist. Because look at him. He's supposed to be a priest because he's born of, of Zacharias. Therefore, he will be a priest all dressed up like this. But he doesn't do that at all. He gets dressed in the funniest dress. He, he dre gear, eats uh, locusts and wild honey, doesn't even stay in the temple to preach. He goes away down by the, by, by, by the, the river Jordan, starts baptizing people. He's the exact opposite. What? I thought God was the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes, but he's not married to a particular method. I don't know why I'm speaking on this tonight. It has happened to me. It may be happening to some of you. God is changing things in your life, and you're finding it hard to deal with. You don't know how to get a handle on it. You don't know hardly what way to, of direction because this is pulling you and that's pushing you. But when you've been praying and honestly asking God to lead and guide and direct you, He will start to do it. And it may be dramatic. And He just wants you to know by whispering El Olam to you that He's got the strength and the wisdom and the secrets to take you through the transition period and then into the whole new phase of your life. Whatever it be, whether it seems to be more prosperity or even if it seems to be more adversity. Think of John the Baptist and what happened in his instance. But let's continue reading. We are usually frightened. Do you see where I'm at there? We are usually frightened as, as human beings, frightened by or bewildered by change. He is the steadfast rock in each new phase. He is the God of the various times, the various seasons, no matter what the devil says or does or how those circumstances were brought about. Now I have a bunch of notes here, and you can scribble on the thing if you want to, or just listen as I run over them, giving little thoughts before we come to our scriptures. God talks about creation in six days. He talks a lot about 40 years. The millennium, a thousand years. God has time frames. He has changed my life completely. And there was times I wasn't aware he was doing it until suddenly I was in it. But if you really are sincere, you want to walk with God. It's not going to be the status quo. God is going to move you into some wonderful things. Number two, there is what's called the law of the first mention. And I've been over that several times with you. And that simply says, wherever a subject is first mentioned in the Bible, this is recognized by all theologians, where it's first mentioned in the Bible, it contains all the core knowledge or the kernel of what you need on that subject, though it's not fully revealed until you read other parts of it in the Bible. But there it is. And in Genesis 21, this is point number three, also continued in Galatians 4, 22 through 30, God is changing dramatically. And in that instance, it's the law changing to grace. Yes, he's the same today, uh, yesterday, today, and forever, but his methodology is different with each of us. So God is in point number five. Forgive the racing to do it. God is in a period in all of our lives of gradual self-disclosure. Look back this way a moment. Remember I told you before, the name Yahweh, one of the names of Yahweh, not only he was, he is, and he will be, but it means the becoming one. Like, like those marshals bringing in the aircraft, taxiing it in. You're bringing it in, bringing it in. You study God's Word, and after a while, and hopefully when you come to these meetings after a while, you're going to see him in sharper focus all the time. He is the becoming one. He's coming, and what's he doing? He's gradually revealing himself to you. Number six, my mother in Ireland, who seemed to pray all the time, she used to say this to me regularly or write it to me or call me here to America before, obviously, she passed away. She used to have this little rhyme. Sometimes on the rock I tremble, faint of heart and weak of knee, but the steadfast rock of ages never trembles under me. Isn't that beautiful? He never does. God knows your new circumstances and is well prepared. Number seven, I'm just trying to drive all this home. He is the steadfast father of the various ages, whatever that is, or times or seasons. That's all revealed through El Olam. 
all of them is the ages or all ages of the times and the secrets necessary to make it a success. I put in there the term the White House. You can look back this way for a second. These are just little highlights to jog your memory. You'll listen to Fox News or somebody and the reporter will say, and the White House said today. Did you ever hear a house saying something? The house didn't say anything. But the house represents the president, the government, the cabinet. It represents so much more. So El Olam, these names of God represent so much. It's God saying to you, come on, come on now, come on. I'll take you by the hand and I'll lead you into this new situation. And I've got the strength and the secrets needed so that you can be victorious regardless of what that situation may be. And I'll get more personal in just a moment or two about this. But let's look at this again. Number 10, L in El Olam. L is for strength. Olam is the ages and the secrets that are needed uh, to take care of the various ages and stages and the hidden secrets. Then that little song that I quoted part of, move, 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 oh, move with God. Then I have 20 years, 20 years, and 20 years. And you can look this way too, I'm going a little quick, but listen. I guess you know that I'm past 39. You, you know that. I look back in, in my life in, in, in stages in many ways. First 20 years was being born and being raised, getting educated, getting your first job, and so forth. Got saved, got to know the Lord to some, some degree. 20 years of age. The next 20 years, both of those obviously were spent in Ireland. It was rockets going off all over the place. It was revival. Thousands were saved. God is my judge. It was the work of an evangelist all over. Whatever city you think of in Ireland, we were there. Limerick and Cork and, and Dublin. And uh, in fact, we had the big auditorium in downtown Dublin where the terrorists, the IRA, used to hold their yearly convention. We were there as Protestants in the middle of that Catholic city. We were there for 10 days. Many nuns and priests came to the Lord, and we made the headlines nine out of the 10 days when we were in the city of Dublin. We had a big tent. We had, not in Dublin, but we had a big tent. We had trucks and trailers. You know, the whole thing, the whole works. It was just... Uh, it was just an incredible period. It was rockets going off. And then God sent us here to America. And then I remember after we came to America for a while, just a few years. Who do you hear this? One day I was in prayer. And I'm just as sure the Holy Spirit said this as anything. But it sounds so simple, it's almost embarrassing to, to say it. He said, you're like a car. This is in my spirit. You're like a car, an automobile. You're like a car. And I'm bringing you in for repairs. <laughs> None of us want to be brought in. Why? Because a car is not made for the garage. A car is made for the highway. But if you do not come into the garage once in a while, you're going to break down on the highway. So from time to time, God will do such different things. I can hardly explain to you the difference between rockets going off, television interviews, radio, everything happening in Ireland, headlines in the newspapers, and that's a country that didn't have uh, Christian radio or television, but just it was the news department that put us on. None of this is a boast. I'm not even interested in that. I'm just trying to tell you the sudden change. I came here, to tell you the truth, saw some things, got so tired of it, loved America, got tired of some of the religious television garbage, and said, God, I want nothing to do with it. I didn't know what I was going to do. I wasn't here that long. I was about just to go in and, uh, the desert and pray. In fact, I would, have, I would have done that completely and not speak to anybody, except for this lady here. For she got hold of me one day this many years ago, coming out of a holiday inn. She said, well, if you're not going to have church or anything, will you come to our home and hold a Bible study? Do you remember, Natalie? We did that for a long time in your home. A long time. And I think we did it twice a week. Because... God wasn't thrusting me with rockets going off. He was pulling me back. And thank God for her and a few friends didn't advertise, didn't do a thing, because it was a time for me to be in the garage. And he started to teach me things. Here's Moses for 40 years. He's in, in, in Egypt, then he's 40 years in the desert, just wandering, eating 
pita bread and drinking goat's milk and one thing like that. But God's dealing with them. But what a contrast. You'd think you must be out of God's will. If that's God's will, then this can't be because it's so different. Not so. You may be made for the highway, but it's all right once in a while to be in the garage and let God deal with you. Or maybe you've been in the garage and now it's God's time to send you back to the highway or to send you to the highway for the first time, as the case may be in your life or in my life. Move, 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 or move with God. I do not ever remember for, uh, for a period of probably 20 more, uh, more than 20 years, maybe 22, 23, 24 years, I don't think I ever remember ending a service, uh, this would be mostly all in Ireland, of course, without giving what could be called an altar call. I'd go there and our men would have up the tent. They had a trailer for a, a, a man, a watchman, to look after it at nighttime and so forth. And I'd come there and preach and God would do great things. And I'm pleased to say, people who got saved in their ministry are missionaries today, many of them in different parts of the world. And I don't remember one particular service ever having it without an altar call call people forward and they'd get saved. The last number of years, and I still do it once in a while, I did it last Sunday morning, and many put up their hand to be saved, probably the best of 15 to 20 people. But mostly, the Lord seems to be leading me, not so much in evangelism, but in a flat out, almost cold turkey, teaching ministry, gather my people together and get around my word and open up my word and feed my people with my knowledge. That's what he seems to be saying. Now, that's a big, abrupt change. You know, if God says to Abraham, kill Isaac, and he's about to do it, and then a voice says, don't kill Isaac, if you're not spiritually mature, you're going to figure that one of those voices is off the devil because they're contradictory. But none of them was off the devil. They were both of God, different phases. God didn't want really Isaac killed. God wanted Abraham killed. Not physically, but spiritually. He wanted him in, 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 in spirit, I should say, in his ego. He wanted to be totally dependent on God. But here's what God has done with me. Uh, you know, when we lived in Ireland, uh, all of this sounds a little highfalutin, doesn't mean a thing other than by way of illustration. Uh, we go to a place in Illinois. What a church. A thousand members in the church, their own Bible school, their own radio station. No, not that they were on radio. They owned the station. They had a school, a regular day school. They had everything. And they asked us to come several years ago and take over, and it'd be a thousand dollars a week. We had to speak twice and do it like after that, and a home provided with a big swimming pool. And we were living in the midst of the bombs and bullets of Belfast and raining between the showers most of the time as well. And God said no. And finally, when God did tell us to go to America, he sent us, and the first service we had, in addition to us five, there were three people in the meeting. What are you doing, God? If you told us not to go to America, why are we going to America? Let us then determine in our hearts the way God's moving. I know my imperfection, it's profound, but I also know that I am in the will of God, being in Tarpon Springs, and I have to tell you, before I came to America, I never heard of Tarpon Springs. And imagine God taking a Protestant and bringing him to the Greeks in Tarpon Springs to reach a bunch of Catholics and get them saved. We can all rejoice in Christ. It's amazing what God's doing. Just amazing. <laughs> But, but it, it's God's in this thing, friends. God's in it. It's not manufactured by anybody. There's no manipulation. God's going to do it. Uh, God, God is going to do it. And he's going to bring in people who are hungry for him and hungry for his work, uh, for his word. And I'll tell you this. If I have to ju do gymnastics up here to please you or get into histrionics and jump through hoops, then next Sunday you'll expect me to jump through two or three hoops. I'm not going to do it. If you're not satisfied with God's word, it's all right. I'm going to keep on doing it, whoever's here or who's not, because I'm called, at least in this phase of my life, and I've dropped anchor here. I believe I'll be here the rest of my life, and I believe my mission is to teach people about God so that they'll understand He's knowable, not just as Savior, but as Lord and a friend that they can walk with every day of their lives. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. I know you can't really break it up exactly into 20 years, but approximately that's what's been happening. Now, number 14 says, 
Peter, strange, 1 Peter 4 and 12. You know, those are just little capsules to remind you. Look this way. Peter says in 1 Peter 4 and 12, look at me while I tell you, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial. Wait a minute. Why would you say to anybody, think it not strange, unless it's the temptation that they're going to think it's strange. You're warning them not to. So think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is sent to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rather rejoice. He wasn't so much, now listen to this, he wasn't so much concerned about the fiery trial as their attitude toward it. They had been saved, they were rejoicing, and now suddenly they're in the middle of persecution. His problem was not that they would fall at the problem itself, but in their reaction, what has gone wrong? Has something seemingly gone wrong in your life? It never rains, but it pours, they say. Ever been in the place where you got one of those registered letters? Ever been in the place which wasn't very nice? Ever been in the place where the only phone call you got was worse than the last, and you thought the last one could not be any worse? Days of adversity. El Ola means, I want you to know that although you're shocked by the change, I'm not shocked. I've prepared everything. El, I'm giving you the strength. Ola, I'm giving you the secrets to carry you through this. And while you're doing it, you're going to be rising higher in me. And that's necessary for the next stage of my purposes in your life. Now, here's a strange one, number 15. This is, this is a biggie strange. This happened to Maureen and I. I'm going to tell you about it. It says simply in your notes and mine, tabernacle build, dismantle. What does that mean? Well, look at this magnificent tabernacle up here. Aholiab and Bezalel were this craftsman, and Moses got it from God, and Aaron, his brother, was the high priest. I mean, the whole thing's magnificent, and a typification of Christ, as you know. Look at me while I tell you. You know what God did? God told them, build it. They built it painstakingly. You know what God did after a while? What he told them to build it, he told them, dismantle it. Take it down. That's got to be the devil. I mean, if God told me to build this, it's got to be the devil that's telling me to dismantle it. No, God said, take it down. You can read about it in Numbers 1 and other places. But listen to this. I learned this years ago. Why did God tell them to dismantle the, ark, the, 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 the whole tabernacle after he told them to build it? Why did he tell them to dismantle it? For transportation. Why? Because he wanted them to move forward, and therefore I learned this years ago. It wasn't easy. That when you're going to move on with God, you're going to have to dismantle something. And I remember when my family, I was very young, when we joined a certain church in Ireland, uh, my mother and father brought us there, and Doring and Ella were there, and I was there, of course, I was the baby of the family, as you know. And Maureen's people were there. In fact, her mother and grandmother were founder members uh, of this church. And so we started to go to that church and loved the pastor. After a while, the pastor left and went away across to Scotland. We were kind of left floundering there a little bit. And uh, Maureen and I started to, to date then. And then suddenly, God showed us marvelously through my own healing and deliverance that while there was a lot of cowboys in that kind of ministry, he is Jehovah Rapha, and there is a divine healing ministry that's proper and right and beautiful, and God wanted us to pray for the sick, and this church got mad with us. Honestly, it's funny now. One of the elders came after me with a brush to, to hit me over the head, and uh, we left. But her parents were there, and my parents were there, and it wasn't easy. But we had to move on with God. And sometimes you've got to leave behind those who do want to go on if you're going to move forward because God said dismantle it because you've got to go forward. I don't know what it is in your life. It may be friends that you've loved so long. It may be family members. It may be associates that you can't associate with anymore. You don't hate them. You're not mad at them. But you just can't continue on that plane that they're on because they're missing it by a million miles. And don't worry if God's saying to you, dismantle something, because what he's saying is, I want you to go forward. It's a new phase. You say, well, I don't understand this. And it's new people. And I feel a bit awkward. Don't worry, you'll soon get used to it. Don't worry about that bit at all. Just know this. El Olam. 
strength, that's El. Olam is, I am the God who will help you whatever stage I lead you into, in spite of the fact it's new, it's strange, it's different, and I will give you the secrets that you need. That's what the word means. I'm not throwing that bit in. That's what it means. Olam means secrets, hidden things. I will show you by throwing light upon life's problems so that you can act intelligently and be all that I want you to be. So whatever stage God says you're in, however big of a fright it brought to you, whatever brought you to this, it could have been a family tragedy, it could have been a bankruptcy, it could have been a sickness, or it could have been something much more positive that God was simply leading you into a new area with Him. Whatever it was, know this, that in all our tomorrows, he is the rock of every age. He's the rock of every stage to give us strength and to give us the hidden secrets that we need to know to live victoriously for Him regardless of what the circumstances are because although they may change, He is the rock of ages forever. Amen. Praise God. Praise Him with me, if you would. Number 17, one of the saddest things today, I spoke about this on television some time back, look this way a second, is the expedited harvest. We've now got it all wrapped up, sent me $58 and you can have your harvest in 58 days. It's blasphemous. It's disgusting actually. But I will say this, if you walk with God, look what happens, number 17, a readied reaper. God has to get you ready. Look this way again, please, quickly. There's some people, you know, listen, there's some people, God could give them $50,000 today, they'd still be in church tonight praising God. Other people, if they got $50, they'd skip church and go out and get drunk or something. God wants to bless you to the point where you can handle it. And when He's got you ready, it says here, a ready reaper and a prepared ripe harvest are sure to meet. So walk with God and don't try to expedite anything. Just go by Him, whatever way He... Let us then determine in our hearts the way God moves and move with God. And we're in His will. Isn't that beautiful? And He's putting something together here. He's putting something together. Amen. Number 18. My life was taken up with evangelism. Now it's taken up with the teaching. Go to some scriptures. Is that where you go to next in your notes there? It goes to scriptures. Each message is uh, uh, given with uh, scriptures, with notes, so that you can go home and dig a lot more. Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 through 8. To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born, a time to die. A time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill, and a time to heal. A time to break down, a time to build up. A time to weep, and a time to laugh. A time to mourn, a time to dance. A time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get, and a time to lose. A time to keep, and a time to cast away. A time to rent, and a time to sow. S-E-W. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. Look back this way. You know that's the truth. This is life, isn't it? Paul said, I know how to abide and I know how to be abased. What God is trying to tell us by El Olam, listen, the weather might change your circumstances might change dramatically, and you may think it's for prosperity, or you may think it's for adversity. I want you to know that nothing has changed between you and me, and just like I brought you through everything up to this point, I'm going to bring you through everything in the future, no matter what it is, whether it's increased blessing with this extra temptations, or increased attacks of the devil with that uh, horribleness that comes with that, I'm still going to be God, and I want you to be comforted to know You've got the strength, and you will have all the secrets that you need to know to be successful in your new environment. I was such, look this way, I was such a shy little boy in Ireland. You don't believe my shyness. You know my two sisters. They'll be here in a few more months. You know, they normally talk on Thursdays. I told you that before. <laughs> they are so quiet, and I was so quiet too. And in the big Presbyterian church when we went there, I usually would get a first prize because 
my mother sent us every Sunday. And on that occasion, you would go into the big church. The pastor stood up with his big, long, flowing robes and read out all the first prizes. And you were to walk forward and meet the pastor. I hid under the pew. That's the truth. And, and you may think, well, you know, a person sits up and it's no bother. Well, I suppose you do it for a while. But the idea of that little boy not only stand in front of people to speak, but to speak to um, ha, uh, pros prosperous and educated Americans in the greatest country in the world and on television is almost like a joke. Because I didn't want that. Tell you the truth, I still don't want it. If I went by myself, I'm not asking to be a preacher at all. My thrill is in obeying God. It's not st standing up in front of you or sitting up in front of you. But it's such a change in my life. And we're inclined to say, I can't handle it. I can't do it. It's too big. I can't do it. Suddenly, your spice is gone. Suddenly, you had to move halfway across the country for some reason. You don't understand it. God is still God there as he was here. He's still God in your new situation as he was in the old. You've got to accept that. Psalm 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from, you know what it says in the Hebrew right there? You can go home and look it up. It says, El Olam. Even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God, or thou art El Olam. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, in all the stages from there was nothing until this moment. You're God, you're always God, and you always will be God. I need a little encouragement. Are you getting any of this, friends? If you are, you praise the Lord. Praise God with me. How we, how we love him, don't we? From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God in every stage, whatever you're facing today or tomorrow. Isaiah 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. That word, by the way, means a pleasant surprise. Isn't that nice over there? A pleasant surprise. He's not blue molded, is he? He's not mildewed. His mercies are new every morning. He's our counselor. He's the mighty God. You know what it says there in Isaiah 9, verse 6? What it says in the Hebrew, it says he is El Olam, the Prince of Peace. Yes, I am redundant, but I'm going to say it anyway. He is what? Let me give it all to you again. Wonderful counsel of the mighty God, the Prince of Peace. And he is still God, regardless of the change in your circumstances. God may finally bring you back to old circumstances too, or I don't know. He can do whatever he wants. I was coming around here driving on my own, and I was singing, strictly between me and the Lord, for nobody else to hear, because I can't sing a lick. Can't sing a lick. But I was trying. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will, while I am waiting, while I am ready, waiting and still. I think that's what it says there. Thou art what? You're wonderful. You're the counselor. You're mighty. You're the prince of peace. And you're God regardless of my changing circumstances. You're still God. Even when I'm hit in the solar plexus by life. Isaiah 40, 28. Aren't these lovely scriptures, by the way? They're beautiful. Isaiah 40, 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that El Olam? That's what it says in the Hebrew. The Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He knows everything. He knows everything. He knows everything. He knows everything. He's well prepared for tomorrow. He told us, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Don't try to plan for tomorrow in the worryful sense. It's all right in the other sense. Don't do that because you don't know what's going to happen, but I do, and I want you to know you're going to be taken care of regardless. And so it says, did you not know this? Hast thou not known? Did you not hear that El Olam, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he fainteth not, neither is weary. Why does it say that? To point out the difference between him and you. Do you not know that you and I, we do get weary, we do faint, but he doesn't. He's not subject to that. 
And there's no searching of all the stuff that he knows. Acts 3, verse 19. Jumping it on over into the New Testament, the same thought. El Olam, of course, in Hebrew. Now we're reading in the Greek, but it's the same thought. Acts 3, 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Look this way. Brother Herb and I here several years ago, a number of years ago, whatever, heard about this building, came and had a look at it. It was immense. We left to drive around, and uh, I got out of the car to go to the payphone somewhere, the 7-Eleven or something, to call Ruth Ann about something. And I went like this, and had to go back to the car, rather embarrassed, and said, Brother Herb, would you happen to have a quarter? He always thought that was funny, and so did I in reflection, because we're looking at this building. <laughs> and all, all these acres, you know, millions of dollars, millions of dollars. <laughs> and, and I didn't have a quarter. Now, that seems like a story, but he will verify that's, a true, that's true. That actually happened. Well, then, after a while, we get the property on a what did you call it? A pay to own. Lease to own. And then you remember I had that big attack. These things are not that long ago, a big attack physically. And so for a while I couldn't even do anything, hardly. And so then suddenly we're just about cut off. And so uh, we have until a Friday to pay it off or surrender it. And we needed $1,115,000. $1,115,000. Somebody said, well, it's not much, and you say it fast. That was the problem. I couldn't say it fast. <laughs> $1,115,000. We talked to the bank, our own bank. They said there was a wire in from us. I can tell you, from out of state, that's for sure. Ruth went round. She told me later, she said, you know, those people were awful nice. She got a cashier's check to take it up to the lawyers of the owner, Mr. Pappas, the famous Mr. Pappas from Pappas Restaurant. And that day, she paid off the whole thing with a cashier's check for $1,115,000. All paid off. The whole thing. Wow. But here's what I want to tell you, friends. Though that to us is a lot sweeter than the day about the quarter. But I want you to know, God was still God that day when I couldn't find a quarter as when he paid off over a million dollars. He is still God to be trusted all the way. Blessed be his name. And so he's brought us into a time of refreshing and took that load off us. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. There it is. God knows what to give you and to tell you and how to lead you and the doors to open and the people to bring into your life and the people to push out of your life and the people to overrule. God knows what to do with his hidden wisdom. It's all enraptured in Christ. It's an El Olam. Ephesians 2, 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. In other words, he's going to show the exceeding riches of his grace to you in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus, regardless of what those ages are, up or down. Ephesians 3, 9 through 11, and to make all men see what is the fellowship. By the way, these verses are like messages in themselves, but they're simply not time. Read it when you get home. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let me give you another scripture to go along with that. My God shall supply all your need. You might say, well, I wish you'd give me a million dollars, 115,000, maybe you don't need it. But if you need it, he'll give it to you. Or a quarter. Or $50. Or 
or an intervention from somebody or an interjection, whatever the age is, whatever the stage is, there is the manifold wisdom of God moving people and pieces out of the road as the master chess player in order to bring his purposes to pass in your life, not because you're perfect, but because you're trusting. Ephesians 3, 21, we're almost through. Unto him be the glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout what? All ages. So we give him the glory no matter what age or stage we're going through. Did you get that? I had a lady say to me one time in Ireland, I said to her, I was walking out the door of a church and I turned around, she's standing against this wall. I said, praise the Lord, sister. And she said, I only praise God when I feel like it. But the look on her face, you know, I felt sorry for God because she probably never felt like it. <clears throat> but the idea of this is whatever the age is, whatever the stage is, you learn to praise God anyhow. And it says here, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages. You can skip over that unless you get to know what it means. It's El Olam. No matter what the age is, what you're going through, world without end, we're going to praise God whether we're up or down, in or out, summer or winter, good times, bad times. No matter what time it is, let's praise the Lord. Colossians 1, 26 through 29, even the mystery, which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. What is the mystery? Hid from the ages. What is it? Tell me. I'll tell you. All right, Paul could say. Look at me while I tell you. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the secret. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory, whatever it is. But what, what is this? Why can we praise him in all ages? Because Christ is in us, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Hebrews 11, excuse me, Hebrews 1, verse 1. God, who at sundry times. There's an old saying in Ireland, I suppose you have it here, different horses for different courses. You, you've heard of that term, haven't you? Different horses, different courses. God knows things change in all our lives, but he's a match for any change. That's what Al Olam is saying, summed up. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Revelation 11, 15, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of this world, kingdoms, excuse me, of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and forever and forever. Why? Let me tell you, friends, because he's always that mighty rock of ages. Sometimes on the rock I tremble, faint of heart and weak of knee, but the steadfast rock of ages never trembles under me. He is the God who is sufficient for any given hour, any given phase in your life, any given problem, or any given dramatic situation. God is sufficient there like he was sufficient anywhere else. If he was ever sufficient, he always is. Look at the summary, and we're through. El Olam means, in its widest stretched out sense, the everlasting God. That is, he's always God. Break it down a bit. The one who fulfills his purposes in stages or ages as he leads us on, and who imparts strength, El, and secrets, Olam, for each new happening, whatever it is, to prove himself God, no matter what circumstance we face. And I say, to God be the glory. Amen. Let's all stand and praise him, will we? Come on, put your hands together and praise him. Come on, praise him with me. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him.